Tuesday, April 16th. I'm Adam Walsh, and this is The Signal. It is federal budget day, and I've got a panel of folks lined up here to talk about what's already been announced, what's expected, and what it all means for you. And we're asking, what do you think about government spending? What should the priorities be? What would you change? And if you're just tuning in, if you want to watch this later, we're going to pop this show up on YouTube as well. We've got uh, a bunch of great stuff on CBC NL's YouTube page. The Signal has its own playlist. And no, it's not songs. It's great shows like this one is going to be. Those questions there. What do you think about government spending? What should priorities be? What would you change? That could be federal that can be provincial. Heck, it can even be municipal. If you want to join the conversation, text us, 709-327-8206. Emails, the signal at cbc.ca. So Finance Minister Christia Freeland will table her fourth federal budget today. Plans will be laid out for spending billions with a B, on, uh, on housing. It's also a pitch for voters, right, as the federal conservatives are riding high in the polls. Uh, a lot's already been announced so far in the lead-up to today, right? Bit of a different year, because a lot of times you wait for the big day. But this year, it's, you've heard from uh, Freeland herself, the PM, Housing Minister Sean Frazier, and others. And from CBC News, Ottawa, uh, here's the numbers, right? So I don't crunch these. Ottawa has announced roughly $38 billion in new financial commitments, including $17 billion in loan-based programs. Programs, and this was before the release of today's budget. On top of that federal budget discussion, we will also revisit the provincial one, briefly, but from last month, because all of this matters to you, your life, your bottom line. It's all connected, isn't it? So joining us here in studio, I've got three guests for today's conversation. Lynn Gammon, Associate Professor with Memorial University's Economics Department. I was like, I, don't know why I couldn't say economics there. How are you doing? Hi there. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. And we've got Jessica McCormick, President, Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. Hi, welcome back. Hi, thanks, Adam. And Christina Ennis, HR professional who, focus on, who focuses on business development. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. How are we feeling about, like, what's it for each of you in your perspective lives when a federal budget, because federal budget, it's a bit different than the provincial one, but what's it like for you? How are you feeling about the budget and where things are at right now? Uh, Lynn, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, coming about a month after the Newfoundland and Labrador budget, it's uh, probably less central to people's thinking, I think, um, here. The other thing to think about is the federal budget is for all of Canada. So there might be pockets of spending or programs that really directly affect us here in this province, but it's an overarching um, outline of where we're going with things and, and the priorities for the nation rather than just for certain regions in particular. Yeah, right. Some of the spending all of a sudden gets into like geopolitical stuff too, right? Like you're looking at military spending Sorry. and Arctic sovereignty and stuff that like, I don't know, it's not in my day-to-day -day thinking here perhaps, but uh, or for, for folks, but uh, it, you know, important nonetheless. Yeah. And so there'll be some things that are much longer term as well that, you know, there's, of course, things like the housing spending that are, is dealing with an immediate, more immediate crisis, uh, but also longer term things about productivity I'm expecting to see in this, even though we won't see that in the budget timeline, the impacts of that. But investing in different types of infrastructure and technology, of course, are important for the, the labor force across Canada. Right. Uh, Jessica McCormick, what are, for, for yourself. Yeah, I think a lot of our work often kind of focuses around the decisions the provincial government is making, but so many of those programs are supported by federal investments. Right. So when we think about childcare, which I've been on your show talking about um, in the past, Adam, a lot of that funding comes from from the federal government. So we we try to keep an eye on that. Um, I think for our members and and for working people, whether they're union members or not, um, any measures that address affordability and the cost of living are going to be very important to us. Um, and investments in jobs and training. Um, so a lot of that money does flow from the federal government as well. So, um, you know, are we tying those investments to quality of jobs, for example? Um, those types of things are, are things that we're looking for in sustainable jobs. And then, of course, taxation and the impacts on working people. It's always interesting, isn't it? Like we, you, you have the provincial budget, which is still a lot, a lot of money, right? When you're a regular person looking at the spending like the, that provinces or this province will do, it's a lot. But then when, you come, when it comes to federal budget day, you're like, oh, 
And then when you realize, oh, a lot of the things we talk about here, like any time I do a show about municipalities, it's always like, well, we're waiting for money. And a lot of times that money is federal. Yeah, child care is a great example. You yeah. know, there hasn't been a huge investment by the provincial government in our child care programs. The, the you know vast majority of that funding is coming uh, through through the federal program. So, and and we know that we still have gaps um, in access to child care. So, something to keep an eye on in the federal budget. Mm-hmm. Christina, what about you? Um, Yeah, so I'm really looking forward to taking a bit of a closer look than I ever have at how Newfoundland and Labrador kind of fits into that national budget and kind of taking a look at what's good for us and what might be disproportionately affecting Newfoundlanders and Labradorians in comparison to the rest of Canada Um, and on the heels of the 75th anniversary of Confederation. That's something that definitely has piqued my interest over the last, um, I'm going to say, several weeks. and as well as Jessica mentioned, the kind of the overlap between jurisdictions, housing is a great example. You know, you need municipal, provincial and federal involvement to make that successful. Same with child care, you know, promoting affordable child care without the boots on the ground logistics of actually increasing accessibility to spaces. You know, is is that yeah. really benefiting us in a way that is being being communicated? So. And what's yeah. the when when you're out like so whether it's like HR business development you're you're heavily involved in community like what are you hearing from folks now uh, in in kind of your orbit or ecosystem about just the state of whether it's the economy or where we're at for for the day to day. So it, it's really interesting um, if you kind of broadly ask a question to a group of folks who aren't really engaged in, you know, following the news every day like we are. Um, if you say, you know, how, how do you feel about politics? Politics is not a good word. It's a bad word. Mm-hmm. It's not something people are interested in. But then if I say, you know, do you have childcare yet for your six-month-old secured? Nope. And you can't get people to stop talking about it. Or is your mortgage up for renewal this year? And can't stop talking about it. Um, so it's really interesting. I think people think they aren't interested in politics, but also don't realize that the day-to-day issues that we face are literally political political issues, and it's our government that's making those decisions and, and uh, yeah, facilitating oh, yeah. these these things cost, that are very important. Cost of living, right? You know, I mean, was it a couple months ago, everyone was, you had a lot of folks speaking out because a certain uh, grocery store was saying no more 50% off stickers, right? Like that, like, that's an interesting thing that goes on when you say, oh, I'm not interested in politics. But, well, hey, like you said, it's all politics, right? It's all about how money is being spent, what uh, what bills are being passed. It all affects us. Uh, how's the economy doing? <laughs> um, maybe not as bad as they were expecting at the, the fall update. Um, yeah. it, we're not technically in a recession. We haven't had three quarters of a decline in in. Um, in overall economic activity or GDP. So I think we had a very a small increase of 0.2% in the fourth quarter of 2023. Um, and and there was a, a small decrease before that. So it's kind of holding its own, I suppose. And I think some of the commentary leading up to the budget day has been talking about how it's been more resilient or stronger than, than had been anticipated at this point. So which is a good thing on, on the revenue side for, yeah. for the budget. So yeah, if the if it's stronger than expected, it means that the, perhaps the federal government would be taking in more revenue from taxation and other things, and and which is better for than announcing spending and, and all of that. Yeah, so it can have a, a positive impact on the bottom line. Now remember, you're talking to someone who dropped two economics courses oh, in university, so <laughs> we'll just keep it. I, like, keep, why is it? I know. Like, why is a recession? Why is a recession bad? A recession is bad because it show it's a slowing down of the economy and economic activity. So we have less demand compared to supply is the overall big picture. Um, it ends up with unemployment greater than the normal or natural level of unemployment. There's always some workers who are out of the job out of jobs at particular points in time. But in a recession, it's because of that economic activity being lower because there's less demand in the economy than there is supply of the outputs. Right. And so when you have that, you know. There are arguments about whether we should always strive for more and more economic growth. Um, And I think it's about a a sustainable level of growth that is the aim of most economies, that you want to be able to create more, more opportunities, more higher standards of living in terms of material output per capita. Um, But a recession is kind of the downturn of that. Right. 
Okay, good. Because it's always interesting when we come up, it's like, oh, we might be approaching a recession. Oh, we were just stay, like staying away from it. And it's kind of like, why is that good? Why does that matter? What are the, like, what's the context around yeah. it? So, And I think, you know, I said at the beginning there that it's technically we're not in a recession. So there is a technical yeah. definition of it. But sometimes downturns, even in, a, in one quarter, do feel quite significant for, for people. And depending on how downturns in the economy affect different sectors, different industries, of course, there are certain households and people that are going to be more affected higher skilled workers versus lower skilled workers, uh, people in the in manual labor versus people in the high skilled um, knowledge based economies, those kinds of things. Yeah. So for all intents and purposes, some people could feel like they are in a recession, even though technically. Yeah. Not... Or even at very good times if, yeah. if it's having adverse impacts. So, for instance, the onset of AI, the concerns there are that, that while it might be good for overall economic growth, the concerns are that there's going to be job losses in, in some in certain occupations. And those people, of course, even though the economy might be growing, if AI takes off and creates all kinds of advancements in productivity and things, although that remains to be seen, um, it, there are losers and winners in every kind of development in the economy. Mm. I've got some tape to play uh, because, because we wanted to hear from folks about uh, where they think government, and we just said government, should be spending money because, like I said at the start of the show, right, like spending it, it affects us all. And it doesn't matter who's like where the money is coming from uh, for a regular person. It's, it's just money, government money being spent that, that affects them. And and, the, and there's like lots of overlaps these days, right, for whether it's the, the federal government or the provincial one that's spending money. So the signals Amanda Gear hit the streets yesterday and was speaking to folks. Uh, we've got uh, we'll play another bit later in the show. But here's the first bit of people talking about uh, where they think government should be spending money. What should our government be spending their money on? Hiring more registered nurses. That's my that's my bet. <laughs> What's yeah. your name? My name is Jessica. What should our government be spending money on? Unemployment. There are a lot of people in unemployment and housing. Yeah. And well, it wouldn't hurt to put some money into the health care. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know about the rest of the country, but the health care here sucks big time. Right. I have friends of mine that they waiting too long for tests, and they ended up. I had a friend of mine, his mother ended up going to the states. She didn't want to wait as long as they had her on the waiting list. Well, housing, I mean, you got, there's, you got to do something for the housing. That's a must. And then unemployment, uh, I mean, Newfoundland never could support the population that's out of it. Never did, never will. So that's why most of them are moved, the young people, when they graduate universities and that, and they move away. What did you think of the provincial uh, budget when it came out? Mm, I wasn't too pleased with that. What's your name, sir? Ron Murphy. Thank you very much, Ron. You have a lovely day now. What should our government be spending money on? Probably better stuff for schools and education and helping homeless people and stuff like that. I don't know. Bringing the food prices down and gas prices down. Uh, that's pretty much it. Can I get your guys' names? Kaylee Slaney. And uh, Ethan Drover. What do I think the government should be spending money on? Mm -hmm. Rolls for one. Yeah. Well, I think that people should be getting more for minimum wage, stuff like that, jobs, should be more like put into the economy for like infrastructure and stuff like that. It's a big thing. And just overall living, cost of stuff, price of things, groceries. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's rough and so, totally I just, it. you know. What's your name? Ray is my name. Healthcare. Healthcare, yeah. <laughs> that's your number one? Yeah, because we just finished nursing school, so that's a big thing for us is yeah. healthcare and all that stuff. Yeah. And what are you seeing in the healthcare uh, field here? Um, hospitals, very busy, not enough beds. None of us pretty much got any permanent jobs. Most of us got temporary positions. So it would have been nice to see more permanent jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. We're short staffed too. Yeah. And like they're not giving us temp uh, permanent jobs. And they're saying they're short-staffed, and obviously we're seeing it, but we're not getting the jobs that they're offering. Well, uh, some people are planning to leave if their temporary positions uh, end up ending, and they go casual. So, And it was really strange because I uh, did a preceptor at a hospital before, and I worked as a nurse collegian there. And the manager was saying, we're not accepting any more casuals, but all of our positions end in casual positions if we don't get extended. So it was kind of like we've been getting mixed messages and everything with that. 
And when did you when did you finish school? Uh, we just finished. Uh, we graduate in April. And it also ends up like more people end up in hospital due to not having like permanent housing. And pe like sometimes people who are homeless will go into hospital and go into merge because they're going to get the meals and they're going to have a safe place to stay. So it all kind of connects together. So I'm from CBC Radio, and the federal budget's coming out tomorrow. So I want to know what you guys think our government should be spending money on. Um, probably education and probably better services for young people. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think the environment, definitely, or cleaner, renewable sources of energy. I agree with both of them, probably education and environmental purposes. Uh, there definitely needs to be more housing, especially apartments for young people graduating and now they're starting to move out, they're trying to look for places and it's really hard to find an affordable place, especially being trying to juggle jobs and in school to pay for the expense of an apartment. I absolutely agree. I'm graduating this year and um, trying to find a place to live. I'm going to move in with her, hopefully. Um, it, the housing market here is not very great, very expensive. Very expensive. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely in need, in need of fixing. I don't have a fix at the moment, but I hope they find one. And in light of the federal budget coming out, I'm asking folks, what do you think our government should be spending money on? Definitely roads, I think. Yeah, def most definitely the roads. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm Adam Walsh. This is The Signal. It is Federal Budget Day. So today's show, we're talking about what's been announced already, what folks are expecting, what it all means for you. And we're asking, what do you think about government spending? Where should the priorities be? What would you change? Uh, text us, 709-327-8206. Email us, thesignal at CBC. CA. Here in the studio, I've got Lynn Gambin, Associate Professor with uh, Memorial University's Economics Department, Jessica McCormick, President, Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor, and Christina Ennis, an HR professional who focuses on business development. We had lots of, uh, lots of voices there, right? A real great range. And you're hearing health care, housing and homelessness, cost of living, uh, the environment came up. Uh, you had uh, education, roads mentioned a couple of times. It's, it's all the stuff that we, well, we talk about all the time here. Uh, Jessica, what, you know, your thoughts on what you heard? Yeah, I mean, all of those issues are ones that we are, are looking to see um, what measures are in the in the federal budget. I'll just pick up on on one to start: um, workforce challenges in healthcare. That you know, we have heard a lot from local healthcare workers about um, challenges that they're facing. You know, burnout, understaffing, then you know, lack of beds in our hospitals. So, um, ensuring that there are adequate investments from the federal government, not just you know the the transfers that go to the provinces for healthcare, but I think we also need to see some work around a workforce strategy um, to get you know those stakeholders together and, and talk about how do we address some of the issues that are either pushing people uh, out of the sector or not ensuring that they have secure jobs. I know a couple of those nursing or recent grads um, from nursing programs are talking about you know precarious employment um, in healthcare, which has traditionally been a pretty secure um, job to pursue. Um, in addition to that, just kind of connected, I guess, is um, some comments around education. I'm really interested to see, you know, what types of uh, investments, not just in, you know, training, apprenticeships, those types of programs, but um, what are, uh, you know, what is our federal government going to do for, for new grads? We see in the U.S. that Joe Biden is making huge investments to uh, reduce and eliminate student debt. Um, you know, they're trying to cater to young voters. Will our federal government do the same thing? So that, along with, you know, every other issue that was brought brought up, Adam, employment insurance, reform, housing, all of those things are critically important. Christina, what stood up for you? Um, <clears throat> pardon. Um, I found it really interesting, um, the girl who mentioned the environment, and she said more renewable energy. So mm. off the top when I said, how does Newfoundland Labrador fit into this national kind of picture, yeah. Newfoundland and Labrador is already on 91% renewable energy. Mm -hmm. Other provinces very much are not. So when we say or we hear, you know, we need to use more renewable energy in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's like, well, yeah, cause... from where will we get even more renewable energy and the programs that do help people in their residential homes are reimbursable programs. They don't allow access to people who don't already have the funds to install a mini split or get off home heating oil or, or things like that. So that's an interesting example that kind of yeah, for, for the for folks sure. who are still on oil heat, like what else is like what else could be available? Because like you talk about renewables, right. sure, and then like for here as well, like the, I mean, the, the yes, where we're getting the electricity from, and it's then later there's a conversation about upgrading the grid and, and all that stuff, which is who knows if that comes up, but you know that's just the the, the issue for here. Cool, Lynn, thoughts? Yeah, all the same things, of course. Um, 
healthcare being number one, I think that the first person said, and a number of them repeated as well. I, I, I agree with what Jess was saying uh, about the need for not just the number and the supply side of nurses and other healthcare practitioners, but the the deployment of those, the management, the recruitment and the retention. I think that one's something that's coming up. So healthcare is devolved down to the provinces, of course, um, for the most part, but there is a lot of budget that comes out with directives from federal government about where the spending should be. And I think we've seen an increase in that over time, especially with COVID and the spending that came out for to support that and support healthcare systems. I think we're seeing more targeting of things like data and information management system spending, um, recruitment um, campaigns, those kinds of things where the, there's pockets of money from federal government for that in the budget. When it comes to spending, right, because this is, they're saying, thicker budget than normal, lots of spending, what are we hearing for how that will be kind of balanced out? Like, because there's there's talk of, like, maybe a wealth tax that we might hear from today. Like, what what kind of comes into play when it comes to balancing budgets or just kind of, like, uh, maybe not uh, spit the like, Balancing off spending versus what's coming in. Yeah, so the bal- the budget won't be balanced. No, exactly. Of course. Yeah. Wrong um, word. <laughs> yeah, and I think they're for the the commentary has been forecasting that it's going to be a slower return to a balanced budget than had been anticipated maybe a year ago. Um, I think they're looking at around a forty billion dollar deficit. Yeah. Um, the of course tax revenue is as a main revenue source for governments. There's been talk that. And, and Minister Friedland has said that there won't be any middle class new taxes. Uh, but yes, uh, there's been talk about and I expect to see some kind of high end tax, uh, wealth tax on, uh, on people in the highest, inc- very highest income brackets, top less than the top 1%, I believe. So to see the detail of that, because one thing to think about when we talk about taxes at different parts of the income distribution is people on the lower end of the income distribution can't do as much to try to lessen their tax burden, mm. whereas people at the upper end have ways and means of moving assets in in perfectly legal ways, but in dealing with their wealth to minimize their tax burden as well. So there's that to be concerned about that you know, a, a, say if it was a 5% tax, you're not necessarily getting 5% of all that wealth because there's going to be changes to how that wealth is reported and where it is and what it's in, what forms it's in. When we say, like, the top less than 1%, like, do you have an idea of, like, what that means for, like, just what folks at that level would be making? I'm not sure. I think they said somewhere around $300,000 a year or more. Yeah. So, yeah. I, and, and I think that we're maybe talking about the same figures, Lynn, but yeah. you're the economist. But I, I think that it would be north of that yeah, level I, I, of income. I would imagine, so yeah. pretty wealthy. Yeah. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say those are middle class uh, earners. So. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. And when you're talking about the top, yeah. Less than one percent. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think. Go ahead. Can, oh, so I just wanted to pick up on something yeah. we was talking about around tax avoidance. You know, I, I'd be really interested to see if there are any, you know, measures or regulations in there that try to, uh, you know, address some of the uh, use of of you know tax havens or ways that people try to shelter themselves from, uh, you know, the wealthiest um, try to shelter themselves from some of the the taxes. But I think just connecting this to affordability because we heard people talking about grocery prices mm-hmm. um, in the comments there. And and so I'm really interested to see if there will be anything um, in the budget around a windfall tax. So, um, you know, something that addresses excess profits from large corporations like grocery chains, chains who are, you know, making really significant uh, large profits um, that are in part due to, you know, very uh, significant price increases um, in our groceries. So if we want to talk about not just ensuring people have money in their pockets to pay for groceries, um, we want to see measures that um, address that. We we should also be trying to um, pressure those grocery chains to uh, not uh, inflate grocery prices to the extent that they have over the past couple of years. Yeah, and that can be done through this type of tax. Yeah, you know, we've been in a time of, uh, you know, there's been accusations of greedflation. Mm-hmm. There, I know different other economists have kind of weighed in from different and folks who followed have been weighed in on whether or not that's happening. But like at the end of the day, there have been significant profits. Yeah, absolutely. Right? You're going to say? So right off the top, again, you said we were going to talk about priorities and what we might want to see changed and your question for Elaine about like what really is the value of that, I guess, quote unquote, wealth tax. We're not really sure. So wrote this down. I would like to see the federal government educate people on what the intended outcomes are Mm -hmm. of policies and then logistically how it works, because 
us engaged in this topic, we do not know what the value of that is. So if you say, you know, we're going to tax the wealthy more and the general public says, yay. Hmm. But really, is that making a meaningful impact to things? Hmm. Not sure. Yeah, yeah, and transparency is a big thing. Right? And we just did a show on Friday. So, folks, uh, if you missed it, it is uh, available where you get your podcast on the CBC Listen app and on YouTube, uh, all on the carbon tax. We had an explainer. We have folks in talking about the ins and outs in that because a lot of the commentary around this in the last couple of years has been a, a lack of understanding. Right. So that is available for you to go and uh, in, in, at your listening or viewing uh, pleasure. Lynn. When it comes to spending, right, uh, we talk about debts, deficits. Why why do some folks care? Like, why is that important when you look at government spending? If, if there's, like, a, a debt financing, a time of high interest rates, what can happen uh, for – like, why, why does this matter? <clears throat> Sorry, it gets really expensive. So <laughs> deficit means that the outgoings, the expenditures are higher than the revenues, right? So they're not – we're not uh, – at at this time, we're not covering our current expenditures. So that requires borrowing. And when we, the more a government has to borrow, it already has existing debt, of course, but every year the deficit adds into that debt. And as time goes on, what we're seeing with higher interest rates than we had a few years ago, that becomes more expensive to service. So there is a, a part of the budget that is about debt servicing. So that's making your payments. Um, and that money is not available for all the other things that we hear people saying we should be spending money on. So it's not available. Therefore, t- if we're spending it on debt servicing, it's not available for health care, for roads, for EI and those other things that make life a bit more livable. Debt servicing doesn't seem to benefit us. It's a requirement, of course, because if we need to borrow more in the future, you have to keep servicing your debt. Um, But it's not money that's improving the well-being of people at this time. Yeah, because provincially we've always, like, you hear from politicians around the the Muskrat Falls bill and and all of that. But then federally, it's a lot of money for for debt servicing. And then with high interest rates and and paying that, it, it means something. Yeah. And, and I mean, I'm not an accountant, yeah. um, but of course there's, you know, the temporal aspect of it about when debt, debt becomes uh, due and about when assets are measured and when revenue is actually in, in the pocketbook versus when it's, it's on the books kind of thing. So it, the reality of where the money is at different times. But again, I'm not an accountant. So no, and, and there's also like credit ratings that you can have and yeah. depending on how. And that's a concern for this budget. So, you know, um, there's lots of calls for spending to come down for the size of the public sector to be reduced. Um, but there's also a need for government to make sure that they're not putting um, Canadians at harm. You know, we have an affordability crisis. We have housing issues. We have health care issues, of course, which is, are not unique to Canada by any means. These issues are happening around the world. But the government has a responsibility of showing fiscal responsibility and not showing that they're going to accelerate spending when they can't afford it beyond a certain amount. So it's that credit rating is important to ensure that we can cover off budget items in the future. Yeah, it's interesting because these are all things that it, it you don't think about it really necessarily unless you're like an economist on your day to day. But then when it comes to budget time, you're having the conversation like, oh, okay, wow, credit rating. Didn't think about that or debt servicing, like all this stuff that is actually matters. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there is the day to day spending that has to be done, but the long term perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, is very important for for governments, and it's it's about responsibility. So it's about tempering that. And again, I'm not I'm not an accountant and I'm not a political scientist, but it's also about you know how that's perceived by the public and by voters. Hmm. Hmm. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I uh, great points uh, there from Lynn. I think like when we think about the state of the economy, maybe it's it's slowing a little bit. We're thinking about the inflationary pressures, cost of living, and how that's impacting people in the day to day. We know that government needs to make investments to to deal with those issues, whether it's investments in healthcare or um, you know in in reforming EI, for example. So um, you know, it, it's a bit of a philosophical question, I think, Adam. Like in these times, do we go down the road of a more austerity approach? Or do we make investments in working people um, who need the help? And then where do those funds come from to make those investments? So it's it's about, I guess, responsible fiscal management. But um, how can we, you know, tap into uh, things like our taxation system to help fund some of that through, you know, a wealth tax, windfall tax, those types of things. 
And we also heard from the piece of tape, right, that for when Amanda Gear was out talking to folks about uh, government spending, you did hear someone mention more for minimum wage, right? Mm-hmm. And we are in a time, like like we keep saying, like there's higher inflation. You have unions, right, labor, uh, fighting for higher wages for folks to match where we've, like what's happened with inflation. Then you have got the big conversation of what is a living wage, yeah. right? And, we're th- and I know the pr- province decides on, on minimum wage here, but like it's still all part and parcel of what's happening with like the outlook of cost of living and government spending and, and like that philosophy around where yeah. we should be going as a community and, and a co- province and country. Well, in our federal government, Government is a, a very big employer, you know, yeah. so they do set a minimum wage for yeah. federally regulated workers and they deal with pay equity legislation for federally regulated workers. And as Lynn was mentioning, you know, public service is a huge employer and we want to ensure that programs like employment insurance, uh, CRA, um, those types of systems are meeting the needs of, of people um, living in, in Canada. And so we need to have adequate staff to respond to that. Mm-hmm. Christine, any thoughts just on uh, like pay, minimum wage, or uh, just you know where we are with cost of living and what folks are making? I like what Jessica just said about you know kind of the overall strategy. Like, how are we going to look at this big picture, long term? We need a, a. It's one thing to have a plan, um, mm. maybe in your head, or kind of an overarching one, or a summary, executive summary. But if we don't actually have the details of how we, I'm saying we as if I'm I'm the government. Um, <laughs> yeah. If we don't have a plan to actually roll that out and implement it properly, how are we going to see positive outcomes? There's lots of programs that we we see that um, you know at face value they sound great, but then the implementation of them, affordable childcare, great example. How Newfoundland did not have capacity. Other provinces have lots of childcare spaces. It wasn't an issue for them. Um, But I think around educating people, again, I'm a bit of a broken record here, educating people on what the plan is so that there is buy-in. You can't Mm -hmm. expect every Canadian to just blindly follow some positive statements of, yep, we'll be good eventually, get people involved, and what that actually means um, I think would go a long way to building trust with decision makers at all levels. Yeah, and like, I mean, the detail bit is really important, right? Policy gets announced, but it's like, okay, so there's money for such and such a thing, right? Like, even if we're thinking of like the school lunches, right, and like what's happening. So, what does yeah. that mean for the provinces? Who's going to be like, where's that money going? How does it get that get implemented? What's the breakdown going to be, and the follow through? Because money can go in somewhere, right. but then if the follow through is not there. You get the bottlenecks, like has been brought up with the child care issue, yeah. right? And, and uh, like e- the, the availability of ECEs and training for them. And then there's a whole, again, we go back to cost of living and, and pay and, and everything else. Another big discussion probably that goes on is with ECEs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I think that just an observation from my perspective is that, you know, conversations coming out of Ottawa have gotten so polarized yeah. um, mm-hmm. over the past couple of years. And I think that bleeds over from what's happening in the U.S. But we've lost sight of, you know, how do we talk to people about how this impacts them in their day-to-day lives? Because a lot of that conversation has been replaced by some really torqued rhetoric. Um, so I think that, you know, people want to see government working together to benefit, you know, uh, Canadians um, rather than just, you know, tossing barbs, you know, back and forth at each other. So to speak to Christina's point, you know, more of that kind of straightforward information about how these policies will affect you is important. Oh, well, we're in a time where if you say carbon tax, there's there's like people can come down on one side or another. Mm-hmm. If you say the name Trudeau, if you say the name Polyev, if you mm-hmm. say Singh, like the, 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 it can be very polarizing and then certain comments can follow as opposed to discussion of where are we, what does this mean for all of us and how are we kind of moving ahead together? Yeah. How can they work together to benefit us? You know, what are the programs that they can introduce uh, collectively as government that will benefit Canadians? I mean, pharmacare is a great example of that. People, you know, are going to be really impacted by uh, universal pharmacare um, once we see it implemented. Hopefully, there's something in the budget that moves us further towards that goal. What else are we looking for today in, in thoughts uh, around either what's or what else are we thinking about today? I should say either what's been announced already or what might be to come for the federal budget. Yeah, I think what what we've been saying about the transparency and having the detail. Yeah. I mean, I always would be wanting to see some of the detail. And unfortunately, in budget documents, uh, we see that in Newfoundland and Labrador as well. The, the budget doesn't give the detail. It says the tax, it gives the broad strokes of it, but we don't see the, the what's inside the box. <laughs> It'd be neat if you could just click on a link and then and the just, plan would yeah, be there. That'd and, be pretty good. Yeah, some little calculators would be nice from yeah. time to time. And I think that additional information gives people that whether you like it or not, 
at least you know, mm. and you can make plans accordingly. So with taxation, for instance, from an economics perspective, it affects people's behavior. But if you're unaware of how it's going to affect you, you're not able to alter your behavior. And sometimes that is an unintended con- consequence um, that the tax doesn't, for instance, the sugary beverage tax, that may not have the impacts if, it, if people don't really understand how it works or how it's going to be applied to them. And so we might see some of that with taxes, different taxes. Unfortunately, like I said before, for people on the very top end of the income distribution, they probably do have better understanding of it. They're able to get that understanding and information to alter their behaviors accordingly. Um, but on the other side, you I mean, you asked about what you're look, we're looking for. I mean, government's already announced a lot of money for educating early childhood educators, um, in the trades to, to support the construction industry. I think capacity is a big issue for Newfoundland and Labrador, thinking about the labor market capacity we have currently, um, how how there might be some upward pressure on wages. But there is certainly a need for uh, strengthening education and training and ensuring people have labor market information to, to make decisions about what they want to enter into and where jobs are available. Oh, I was listening to the House on the weekend and they started, because uh, they're talking about the housing, right? Mm-hmm. And the House. Started, anyways, they're talking about housing and they started with a brick layer, right? A guy, someone who's learning, uh, like upskilling with, with like being a mason. And then because of the push for housing, just saying, hey, we need so many more apprent- people going in to be apprentices to learn how to do this for the building of all the stuff that is needed for the, the housing crisis. Then you go with like healthcare, like we've been talking about already and everything else with this, uh, like the labor shortage because of all the boomers retiring and just like the reality of, of Canada for where, where it is today. I mean, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah. Well, and we can think about like investments in housing as a tool to encourage opportunity for apprenticeships. So mm-hmm. if our federal government is, you know, providing tax incentives or other programs to support um, construction of, of, of new affordable housing, you know, some of that money should be tied to ensuring that those jobs that come out of that construction are, you know, including apprentices who need the, the training to move uh, through their field. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's go to that second piece of tape. So Amanda Gear out on the streets yesterday asking folks about government spending. Lots of folks were talking to her, and uh, I think 99% of them were, ni- were nice. Right, Amanda? She's not giving me a th- thumbs, <laughs> thumbs up. 99.9%. All right. Uh, here, we, here we go. Listen to this tape. Uh, in light of the budget coming out tomorrow, what do you think government should be spending money on? On psychology services and on training um, up-and-coming psychologists. Yeah, just general health care. Education, for sure. Um, it's so important um, to um, take care of the future, and I think education is the best way to do it. <laughs> Very good question. The usual thing is in this province, like health care, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, housing, I think, is a good one, and they are, I understand, spending some money on housing. Yeah. So those are the two things I would wish for. What's your name? Thorne. Thank you very much. You have a great day. You too. I'm not sure. <laughs> Teach me, but Teach me. Uh, maybe like the health care? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Basically, the, I believe in the social programs are putting forward a good and the environment. Those are two big areas that uh, they need to focus on mm-hmm. and basically managing the resources as best they can. Mm-hmm. Right? I'm on CBC Radio. Uh, federal budget's coming out tomorrow. What do you think our government should be spending money on? They should uh, spend on the buses for this uh, this city because the buses problem is really very hard for the students, the international students. It's really hard. That's what I think. And another thing is the medical. It should be like go more upper so that the people like us, they can go to the hospitals and get the medical free and like fast because they are not fast. Yeah, I think so. They should care about us because we are paying fees to the colleges and the taxes to the government. So they should also like have to care about us. Yeah, because we are paying high taxes. Even the fees, our fees is like more than three per, uh, like more than maybe 50 or 70 percent than the local students so we are facing some problems like the housing problems as well the canada is a really ve- uh, very good country mm-hmm. even in every terms but some of the things if there is like advantages so there is some disadvantages as well so we should focus on the things we are, that the government should cover for nowadays yeah what's your name it's ramandeep thank you very thank much you so have a good day thank you 
I'm from CBC Radio, and the federal budget's coming out tomorrow, so I'm asking folks, what should our government be spending money on? Roads. <laughs> Fix the roads definitely is roads, destroying yeah. my car. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. What else? Uh, healthcare, for sure. Definitely healthcare. I think we could build smaller homes and stuff like that, have more money and put into it. And, yeah. Or uh, even apartment buildings, because we don't have many, very many of those, right? Yeah. 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 And what do you think? I mean... I've never had a house because I could never afford one, so... Yeah. Lower mortgages for you, hey? Yeah, anything. Can I ask you how old you are? 27. I can see you got your hands full, but I'm asking folks today, since the federal budget's coming out tomorrow, what do you think our government should be spending money on? Our children and our children's future. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I don't know. You guys don't know? No. What do you think the government should be spending money on? Child. Child, what else? And our school systems. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank What's you. your name? Leanne Hounsell. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe housing, because there are a lot of shortages of houses, right? What's your name? Manpreet. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Roads, schools, uh, hospitals. I'm Adam Walsh. This is The Signal. Uh, yeah, spending money on childs. I agree. I don't know who would uh, disagree with that one for the the young commentator there from Amanda Gear out on the streets talking to folks. This is our, uh, it's our federal budget day show, and we're talking about uh, what's al- already been announced for the federal budget, what's expected, and we're drilling down into what it might mean for you. And so we're asking, what do you think about government spending? Uh, where should the priorities be? What should change? Give us an email. Uh, the signal at cbc.ca. Text us, 793-278-206. Here in studio, I've got three guests today. Lynn Gambin, Associate Professor with Memorial University's Economics Department. Jessica McCormick, President, Newfoundland and Labrador Federation of Labor. Christina Ennis, HR professional, focuses on business development. Uh, thoughts on what we, Christina, what do you think? What do you think about what you're probably Childs? Seeing Childs you over here just like looking around like crazy, just fired mm. up about Good. what I'm about to throw into the mix. There we go. Okay. I will circle back to how this relates to, hmm. I'm going to say about regionalization. Yeah. Okay. So regional economic development, I'm going to shout out to the Harris Center, mm-hmm. amazing organization. If you've never heard of it, I highly recommend. Yeah. Um, so, so getting more involved in that space over the last couple of years, the Econ- Economic Developers Association is absolutely growing in this province. And how we as a province mm-hmm. compare to how other provinces do regional economic development is very interesting in that other provinces already have mechanisms to kind of create boundaries and borders of geographic regions to focus in on things. Mm. We do not have that. Um, There's duplication of efforts all across the province, and it's starting to happen organically in some pockets of of the province um, with just motivated folks who want to save on operational costs and give residents of those rural areas more opportunity to stay there, really. Um, so we think when we think about transportation, the lady who mentioned the buses, um, delivery of health care, um, decreasing operating costs of municipalities where there's duplication everywhere. Instead of having 50.5 resources as a town clerk, we could have a bunch of full-time sustainable individuals working there um, and that can increase overall service delivery in these communities so but that funding a lot of it you know comes through ACOA mm. and that's a federally funded organization that really positively impacts businesses and communities where as a province we are not giving those communities ample opportunity to take advantage of this federal program that um really could be of benefit, especially when we want to keep rural Newfoundland vibrant and Labrador. Uh, Great point. Jessica? Yeah, I want to pick up on some of the comments uh, that were coming from an international student, I think, was interviewed there and and some newcomers. So um, obviously housing is a a key issue for uh, the folks uh, in our province who are are newcomers. So ensuring that they have access to affordable housing, um, whether they're students or or workers or, you know, students and workers um, here in Newfoundland and Labrador and ensuring that we have, you know, um, uh, 
regulatory reform that uh, gives people a pathway to permanent residency. Um, just to connect it to one of Lynn's points around, you know, our, our uh, workforce needs and, you know, do we have enough workers to, to meet the jobs of the future, ensuring that those are, are good jobs and not low-wage precarious jobs, and that if, you know, we are bringing uh, temporary foreign workers to our province, that they have that uh, pathway uh, to stay here in Canada and that they have a, a good livable wage um, while they're here and working. So, um, you know, I want to, you know, emphasize that we need to be uh, welcoming and investing um, in population growth and development. And that includes, you know, not uh, seeing international students as uh, just a revenue source for our public institution, but, you know, real contributors through, um, you know, to culture and society, but also through the tax system. Yeah, folks for community building. Absolutely. Lynn, thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, some announcements already for this budget have come out about um, a fund. It's only fifty million, but to uh, to get a fund a bill of rights to better protect tenants who rent their homes. I think that's an important thing that we're seeing more. I think one thing that comes up in the comments from the the people on the street is that the shape of what life looks like in Newfoundland, Labrador, and Canada is changing. I think you know, mm. there's much more em- emphasis now than when I entered university here back in the late '90s much more interest in and a, 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 a desire to have things like public transport, walkable communities and that. So even though the federal budget is such a broad thing across Canada, where the money hits the ground is in municipalities, in communities, like you said. And and that's where people want to see those things happening. And the federal government can't tell us exactly how to spend that money, but what the overarching umbrella or the policies that they're setting out hopefully does, does give the space for communities, for provinces to, to come up with the ideas to, to make use of those funds and put them to use for the benefit of people here. You know, a house, someone mentioned not having a house yet, you know, a three-bedroom, two-story house is probably not the ideal for a lot of people, you know, yeah. with immigration, uh, with different shapes of families now, all of those things have changed from what the typical normal was for people of Newfoundland and Labrador. Hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, you know, it's a lot to think about. I did find it funny for the name the number of people. So you guess you have some public transit, and then a lot of other people are just upset with the roads. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that, that could be, I guess, for a separate show, depending. I mean, that being said, uh, the province spends a lot of money on roads, and then there's some federal money that's tied can be tied to roads if uh, there's public transit included with it, right? Which is uh, an interesting bit for, for where we're going with things. Yeah, and that's such an important tie-in, right? Because I think people think that, you know, money to pave or fix the potholes and roads is, is flowing from, from the federal government. But, you know, most of that is dealt with by our provincial government. And so, you know, if we want to talk about public transit, that's something that, you know, the feds really have a huge role to play and, and is connected to all of our other issues that we've brought up around, uh, you know, access to housing that's, you know, close to the services that you need, uh, um, as well as, you know, uh, our climate change ob- objectives that we have as a country. I'm thinking back now the last month, right? if we're doing the, the, the look at all of it bit. So you, like a month ago, you had the provincial budget. We have what we're talking about today with the federal one. But here's, uh, let me see, I've got the, here's the lead from a month ago by my colleague Elizabeth Witten, right? After soaring deficit, NL plans heavy spending on health and housing. Newfoundland and Labrador's Liberal government has delivered a deficit budget in a document that the finance minister says is fiscally responsible but grappling with increased expenditures. No new uh, taxes, tax increases, or fee increases for 2024-25, although the government acknowledged that the deficit for the current fiscal year is significantly higher than it expected from a year ago. And then it goes down. I mean, the article continues. Folks, you can read it online if you want to look it up for to refresh your memory. What are your thoughts today looking back at that and where we are with the federal government, uh, with the budget that we're looking at today, and what it all means for where we are as folks in this point in time uh, heading forward, right? We've got a housing crisis. We're talking about health, like housing spending, health care spending. There's a just transition we're trying to have happen. There's climate change, cost of living crises. Like, where do you think we're at with, with everything that's being thrown at things? It's a general big, broad old question. I might go run into the woods and live off grid here now, uh, Adam. Um, I, it's really overwhelming to kind of think about it. Yeah. So I, I feel like it can be very easy to just be like, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to pay attention. It is what it is. If you feel like you can't kind of, I guess, impact where your own path ends up leading eventually. Um, but... I do think it's really important that we continue to learn more about how this all works. Um, like I noticed when the provincial budget came out, there was 
billion dollars that didn't really get talked about much, and it was for debt servicing. Mm -hmm. And I dove into that a little bit and learned more about it, and am I happy about it? No. Do I know that it's necessary? Yes. How do we prevent that from climbing in the future? Mm. Not sure. But um, I don't know if that that answers your question. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot. It's complicated. It's also stressful. And then as you learn more, there's a lot of stuff you can't control, but just knowing it it can help inform you for the road ahead for whether it comes to being involved as a citizen or voting or or whatever Mm -hmm. else, right? Yeah. So there, and there's so many resources out there to learn. I wish they were a little bit easier to find because you mm. don't know what you don't know. So how do you Google? Not sure how budget works. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> what would that return? I don't know. But um, it's a suggestion for CBC there. <laughs> See, there we go. I'm okay, the, the next story yeah. meeting this afternoon. They're like, hey, I got a good idea. Toolkit. Uh, I, I will give you credit. Budget for Budget 101 idea. toolkit. There you go. I love that. Let's do it. That's nice. <laughs> That's for that big old question, Big Jessica. question, Adam. Uh, you know, I guess from my perspective and from the perspective of unions, you know, our economy is made up of people, not data points, even though that's a lot of what we hear when we're talking yeah, about real budgets. People. So yeah. um, it's made up of real people. And so, you know, when we're thinking about uh, public spending, you know, I'm thinking about how can this uh, help? Uh, power, or, you know, benefit the people who power the economy, and that's working people. Um, so whether it's investments in, in housing or health care, um, how does that impact the workers um, in those sectors? How does that make it easier for you to afford um, to rent or to buy a home? Um, you know, how do we invest in industries and those investments result in good unionized jobs uh, for workers here in Newfoundland and Labrador? That's how I'm thinking about it. Okay. Lynn yeah, I think that's a great point. We had a visiting speaker last month and uh, who was talking about immigration, but uh, Dr. Mikhail Scooter. But he was one thing that he brought up was about productivity, and I think you're absolutely right that the economy is based on people, people's labor, and so how do we facilitate better use of that labor and ensure that we're investing in those workers, in those potential workers. I think that's another important thing. I think education is often something that's a cut <laughs> or, yeah. you know, it's not seen. It's a it's a cost, of course, but it is a real investment. And that starts from right at the early years, right up to post-secondary in, in all different levels. Um, so I think it's about that. In I think personally, my own opinion is, and probably from my economics perspective, is that the government is there to service when or provide services when the markets really fail and ensuring that people are protected to to what we think is a minimal minimum minimum acceptable standard so i think it's being sure that it it doesn't encroach on workers' freedoms to be able to work to the best way that suits them and to be productive members of society, but also for businesses to take on some of the responsibility of ensuring our workers are are trained and are equipped with the skills that we need for the business opportunities, which will help those businesses down the road. Lynn Gammon, Jessica McCormick, McCormick, Christina Ennis, thank you for this today. Tomorrow, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening, folks. And if you're watching on YouTube, uh, tomorrow on the show, a conversation with Vaden Earl about how a disaster and bureaucratic red tape left an adopted girl stateless, how international lobbying and a media campaign for support led to an eventual touchdown in Canada after a hair-raising journey, and a chat about humanitarian work and how polarized this world is is today. That is tomorrow's show. Vaden's with me for the full show. Taking us out today, remember when this song came out and how much a million dollars was actually worth back then? Because uh, it ain't worth it now. (laughs) 